Mold Design and Material Selection. In this video, I'm going to be going over the thought process of making a mold and selecting the material to make the mold and the casting material to go into the finished mold. So if you just found my channel, make sure you like and subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notified when I post new content. And this tutorial is a lead in to a multi-part tutorial about this mold I'm about to make on this Halo helmet. And this is a fun project and the pattern provided to me by uh, Rhino Props out of uh, Dallas, Texas. So uh, Rhino had this particular prop and he was asking about, this is a 3D printed uh, pattern that he had. And he was curious about how to mold this with this visor being an empty space that I've clayed up uh, and how I would address something like this. So I thought this would be a fun video project and decided to take this on for that purpose. And one of the things about a project like this is having a good mental idea of how you're gonna go about the entire mold and cast before you start. And this is one of the things that trips a lot of us up when we're first starting out. When I got started as a young mold maker back in the 90s, um, this is my like thousand year old monster makers uh, catalog from 1997 to 1998. Uh, when I started out, it was real tempting to find the cheapest material and uh, try to make that work for a particular project. And I learned over time that one of the better, the better approach, the smarter approach, is to start with the casting material that you know that you want to make the end object from and work backwards from that point. So in this case, a part like this, where I want a high impact resistant, uh, rotationally cast, helmet that could be a wearable prop that's a nice strong prop that if somebody drops it or uh, you know it bumps into things it's not going to shatter so I need something that's going to be an impact resistant in product that could be relatively thin but still really strong and something that has good physical properties for rotational casting but we'll get into that more in just a minute but uh, the next step of that is the mold design. So I need to pick out my material, then I need to design my mold, which requires me choosing the right uh, material to make the mold and choosing the right approach. And those two things go hand in hand about making sure your mold design and your silicone or polyurethane, whatever you're using, are going to complement each other and work together. And if you're not careful, all these things can work against each other. So if the casting material is incompatible with the mold material, that's not going to work. And if your mold design isn't compatible with the mold material, that's going to lead to a lot of sadness. So one of the first things I learned years ago, starting out in the late 90s as a professional mold maker, was the importance of taking a part like this and just put it on the table in front of you and stare at it. And I know that sounds crazy, but other mold makers out there, you will you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes you just gotta look at a part and figure out what's gonna make the most sense. And when I started out professionally, I made molds for art bronze pieces. And those were crazy because you could you never molded something this simple and straightforward. You were always molding something like an Indian sitting on horseback and you had to figure out how to cut the thing up and all that. So this is actually much simpler, but you still have a lot of stuff that you have to think out and get a mental picture of your entire process before you start. You never want to wing it and just jump in and start slinging rubber or that can get really expensive really fast. So let's start with the mold design because again, without a good clear idea of how we're going to proceed with this mold, we, it's going to be hard to choose material and of course casting material to go into that mold. So what we're going to do for this is ultimately because this helmet has a lot of uh, straight lines and a lot of detail that I want to make sure is preserved, I'm going to actually do this as a seamless mold because uh, yes, I can put a seam down the back or even across the whole helmet, but I'm going to have to take care to make sure that seam lines up exactly with one of these straight lines. I mean, not a deal breaker if it doesn't, but that makes things a lot easier if you have a, a straight line that follows another straight line, it's just a lot easier to sand and clean up later. But in this case, just for the sake of this prop and making it as easy as possible on the, the casting end, I want this to be a seamless mold. Now the other thing is, 
this seamless mold will be put on a, uh, a rotational casting machine, which means that mold is going to be rotated all around. And I need to account for that. I need to be aware that when that mold starts to move, what's going to happen to it? If we have a mold that's made of too soft a material, that could start caving in and distorting and deforming when it's put on a rotational casting machine. So real important consideration there. Then also, since I'm going with a one-piece mold, and of course that's not always practical, but in this case it is, I need to make sure the elongation of the mold material is enough that I could pull that up off of this part. So either roll that over the top or peel it up and stretch it out and pop that part out. But no matter what, it's going to have to have a fair amount of elongation for it to be able to do that. Um, not like double its size or anything like that, but we are going to need a fair amount of stretch for that to come out. And it's going to do that every time we demold one of these helmets. So obviously that elongation, we want that bit of stretch that we need to be well within the physical properties of the silicone that we're working with. So that said, what I'm going to do, what my plan of attack for this is I'm going to put this at kind of a three quarter angle here so you can kind of see this a little bit better, uh, how this is going to work. But what I'm going to do is divide this up. Once I, I'm going to apply the silicone all over the part and with a very wide flange. And that wide flange is important because later on I need to grip this mold down here to pull this out. And I need a, a nice wide flange in order to do that. And so everything will seat nicely into that mother mold. But having that wide flange helps a lot with the demolding a part like this. So I need that. That's going to be uh, applied all over the piece. And I'm going to simplify the form. With, and by that, I mean as I'm applying my silicone over the whole piece, I'm going to bevel these edges out and make sure everything's filled in so that it's a nice stylized form and my mother mold can come apart in two sections. So ultimately, this will actually be a three-piece mold. I'm going to have a, a three-piece shell. I'm going to have a one-piece silicone mold over the part and a silicone cap underneath. And then I'm going to have a piece of resin here, here, and underneath that separate that all out. And I'm going with a brush-on mold over this because this is a 3D printed part. And this could be done as like a matrix mold or something like that, but it is a hollow 3D printed part. And I don't want to run the risk of uh, having silicone get into the part and my mold level drop all of a sudden because I've got silicone going into the pattern. And maybe later on in a future video, I'll do a matrix mold or a cavity pour, uh, blanket, poured blanket mold over this. Uh, with a resin pattern I pulled from this mold. But for now, a brush on mold is going to be the, the best way to ensure that I get good coverage on all of the part and don't wind up with any air bubbles. And most importantly, don't have silicone running into my pattern here. Now, I'll be using platinum silicone for this. This is another consideration. Platinum silicone is great for parts like this, provided it's compatible with the resin that we're in the uh, printed pattern. So I've already done a test against the surface and if you're new to that process of testing for cure inhibition, platinum silicones can be inhibited by certain contaminants on the surface of a part. So I'll put a link to at the end of this video for my video on cure inhibition. But as long as you know what to watch for with cure inhibition and know what common surfaces to avoid, that's typically not that big of a deal. But that's one of the reasons I'm using a platinum silicone for this instead of, say, a tin cure silicone, is platinums tend to have a higher elongation. There's just a much better range of physical properties in platinum silicones as opposed to tin cure silicones. Also, precision is a lot better. Tin cure silicones do have a little bit of shrinkage um, and if you're making interlocking parts, sometimes that can become a thing. So uh, moving right along. So we're going to make a brush on mold that's going to cover all this. It's going to be keyed into that three piece shell. And we need something again that has the elongation to pull off, but we don't want something too soft. Typically, if I was doing a one piece mold like this, I might use something fairly soft, like around a shore A10. But this, because it's going to be rotated in a machine, uh, or by hand in some cases. I don't want to risk that mold caving in or flopping around inside that shell. 
So what I'm going to do is make this with 5130F. Now 5130 is a, about a 25 on the shore A scale. So not too soft and not too hard. And that's really important. We wanna make sure, again, we're gonna be stretching this mold a little bit. So we wanna make sure that it has a good elongation and it's not so stiff that we're fighting with this mold to get it off. And typically that high elongation you get those that best high elongation in that range of uh, about a short A5 to about a 25 or 30. And then past that, on those firmer silicones, they typically don't have as much of a stretch to them. Um, so we're gonna do a 25 short A silicone for this. I'm gonna use the 5130F, the fast formula, so I can move through, through this uh, process fairly quickly. Now, for the mother mold or the shell, the support shell over our silicone mold, I'm going to be doing that with a brushable resin. And on a, a piece like this, we could do the mother mold with uh, plaster or UltraCal 30 or something like that, but we need to be able to run hardware through this to bolt this together to be able to put it on the machine. We might also have to add some mounting hardware to make it more conducive to rotating on a machine. And that's gonna be a lot easier to do with a resin material versus a plaster material. And then, of course, the weight factor. A resin mother mold, even a really thick, hefty resin mother mold, is still gonna be probably less than half the weight of a plaster mother mold. So we're gonna make that shell out of BR75D. Now, BR75D is a 75D, as the name implies, and the BR is for brushable, so brushable 75D. And that is a nice, hard plastic that works great for making mother molds like this, and it is surprisingly, shockingly strong in really thin sections. So we can make a quarter inch mother mold over this and it will more than uh, have more than enough strength for this kind of part. Now, that brings us back to the original point of the casting resin going into this. Um, I'm making this mold with two different resins in mind. TC-808 Jet Black, because it's gonna work well with this helmet design, and TC-804 Jet Black. Both of those are black resin formulas that are perfect for this kind of part. The 804 has a longer working time and a little bit different mix viscosity, whereas the 808 is uh, it's a two minute working time. And that's the one I really prefer for this kind of thing. The 808 Jet Black uh, has about a two, a little bit over a two minute working time at room temperature. So just enough time to get that batch mixed up, poured into the mold, hit your go on your machine, and maybe do about two layers of that into the mold and you have a really super duper strong uh, resin part out of it. And with a lot of the BJB resins, and I have my, my BJB hymnal here on standby, a lot of the nice, the nice thing about the BJB resins is these are designed for functional parts. They supply a lot of aerospace industry and a lot of people making functional automotive parts that uh, aren't just things that cure into a hard plastic, but they actually have functional physical properties. And that's important for a prop like this. We don't want a, a helmet that is nice and thin and looks pretty, but you bump it into something and it shatters. So real important that we get good physical properties out of it. And as an aside, this is one of those things where going back to my history with uh, Arnold over at uh, Monster Makers, and you see I've got my retired product guide from many moons ago, that uh, real important to have a good relationship with your supplier and talk to them, tell them what you're doing. Say, hey, I'm about to do X, Y, and Z, and I need the finished prop or part or whatever to do X, Y, and Z. What do you recommend? And these guys, they know their stuff. You can talk to them and say, hey, and here's the mold I'm putting it into. What do you recommend? And they might know about formulas that uh, you and I do not know about. So there might be something lurking out there in someone's product line that fits an application perfectly and all you have to do is ask. So that's something I learned again later on in my life as a mold maker that uh, there was a lot of materials out there that I just didn't even know existed and real important to know what those things are. Otherwise you don't know to even ask for them. Now back to the brush on mold. One last thing is the brush on mold that we're going to make. 
Silicones, there are some silicones that can be thickened easily for brush on molds, and there are some that do not respond to chemical thickeners. And some that are designed for just poured black molds that don't have the tear strength to do this kind of application. So real important, when you're choosing a silicone, make sure you choose a silicone if you're doing this kind of approach like I'm gonna be doing on this mold, on this part, make sure you're using a silicone that can be thickened for brush on applications. 5130F can be thickened with the SC5001 Fixotropic Additive. And that is uber important because I hear this a lot. I used to get phone calls about this all the time where someone would buy product X off of Amazon or whatever and then go to start making a mold with it and realize that that particular product was never intended to respond to a thickening agent and one of two things would happen. It would either contaminate the mold material by adding the thickening agent to it or the mold material would never properly thicken, it would never react, and you'd wind up with these paper-thin molds that would easily rip apart. So again, make sure that the materials you're using are work for that purpose and they're compatible with the thickening agents. And again, a quick call to your material supplier will eliminate a lot of sadness in the end. So that's the direction we're going to go. We're going to make a, a one-piece seamless silicone mold over the top with a silicone cap on the bottom and a three-piece shell over this whole assembly that will then go on a rotational casting machine. Now, one last detail is the finish on the end part that we're going to make. Ultimately, these parts will be cast in jet black resin, which means they'll come out of the mold black, ready to paint, dry brush, whatever kind of finish that Rhino's going to put on this. But when we get that out of the mold, we want that to take paint easily. Now, you want to make sure that whatever release agent you're using is either a paintable mold release or something that can easily be removed before the painting process or make sure the silicone is of high enough quality that you can pull uh, a run of resin parts out of that mold with no release. But you wanna make sure you account for that painting process because one of the saddest things, again, is someone grabbing the wrong release agent and this is where uh, I despise Amazon for this reason, is people will go on Amazon and pick up a, a cheap can of mold release, and it will be a mold release that is almost impossible to remove from the cast part. So believe it or not, mold releases are not snake oil. There's very different mold releases for very different reasons. So make sure that all of the things you're using are compatible. And again, the best way to work through that is starting with your casting material, in this case, TC-808 Jet Black, and then work back to the mold, work back to the original mold design, and of course factor in the release agent you're going to be using for all of that. But uh, do that before you purchase any material. And one of the nice things about the 5130F is I've been using enough of that lately that I have a fair amount of that on hand at any given time. So 5130F is kind of my go-to silicone for this kind of mold, but Still, you don't want to try to force your project to fit a specific material. You want to make sure that that's appropriate and it's going to work in all the different steps that it will need to to make a good functional production mold. So that said, stay tuned. I'll be posting the part one video very soon, but I hope that helped a lot of you out about just the thought process that you need to go through. And I know it sounds silly, but I could not tell you the number of hours I've spent when somebody brought me a piece to mold and that piece just sat on my desk for a few days and I would come in occasionally and just sit and look at it, check it out and get this thought going in my head and this mental picture of how, how I was gonna design that mold. Because if you can't picture that all in your head before you start, um, you're headed for trouble. You need to make sure every part of that process you're able to visualize and see how that's going to work before you start putting rubber onto your original part. So stay tuned for the uh, next installment of tutorials. This is going to be a fun multi-part tutorial on this helmet. So stay tuned for that. Big thanks to Rhino for providing me with this uh, 3D printed helmet pattern. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notified when I post new content. And thanks again for watching and supporting the channel.